The scripture reading for today is found in the book of Luke chapter 11 verse 9 and 10. Chapter 11 verse 9 and 10. And it says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks find unto him who knocks, it will be opened. The uh, practice of prayer is truly a powerful engagement that we are permitted by His Majesty, His Father, the Great I Am, the Ancient of Days. A communication that is indeed and should be well received. It's interesting throughout the recorded accounts, the witnessed accounts of the Gospels, that prayer is seen and heard, engaged. The communicative bridge to the Father, of course, through the Son. And it is a necessity of our faith. Prayer has many healing agencies within its meditation. When we are weak, we pray, we are strengthened. When we are strong, we pray, we have joy. Prayer is available to the great power that understands us through His Son. And we would be wise to approach the Ancient of Days in prayer for all of our life experience, our concerns, our request, at times, of course, our sorrows and the many temptations we might find ourselves having to navigate through. The Father is willing. Through His Son, we can speak to Him. And we can find that quite fascinating, truly, that we, mankind, have the opportunity to speak to the power that has created us. Um, we at times can take that for granted as believers, but if we permit our, our thoughts to truly look into the profoundness of such a beautiful opportunity. It can indeed humble us. And at times, and we were having a conversation on prayer just yesterday or the day before, I forget now, but um, we are blessed in this New Testament through the Christ to speak to the Father at any time, pretty much. We go for a walk, we can pray. We are driving our vehicle, we can pray. At times we should when we're driving, right? <laughs> Today's uh, craziness in the traffic zone. But uh, any time, pretty much. Uh, sometimes it's uh, a simple prayer if we are finding ourselves uh, with many people or with a task to, to uh, apprehend and, and all these things. Uh, we can go to God in prayer and He releases our anxieties. He he brings forth a peace in our hearts when we speak to Him, and that's available. And at times, I think it's most important that we take uh, uh, the reverence to bow, to bow on our knees, and uh, speak to our Father, and have a prayer that is more than perhaps a few seconds of thanks, which is, of course, a good practice to have, to thank Him for all things. But I think it is wise, scripturally as well, to perhaps have that 30-minute prayer. 
There I say the hour prayer. It's interesting how it's easier for us to have an hour prayer when we are going through a very difficult moment in our lives. Perhaps we should learn to do so as well when we are having great joy in our lives and to thank God for an hour. We know in a great many ways that is not always available daily, but we should try to cultivate time for that, myself included, because the hustle and bustle of today's world, you know, our careers, our, uh, uh, um, how should I say, responsibilities and priorities, sometimes the week passes by and I'm like, wow, I didn't really take the time to pray to God, independently in our own faith, but also collectively in a household, as a family. A strong family is a family that prays together, correct? So prayer is, of course, the theme in which we find ourselves with this sermon session, continuing in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. The portion of the Holy Scripture we shall proclaim, investigate, and learn, find edification, find ourselves built up, and also challenged. Also challenged. And so as it speaks in verse 1 of chapter 11, the Gospel of Luke, I quote, It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, therein of itself, the master, the king, the ruler, an example is brought forth to his followers. If Jesus prays to his father, certainly we should see such a practice as upright. After he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, perhaps the group of disciples said, you go ask him something for us. Go ask, go ask this question. Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. The way John was teaching us, it was well received and we understood In such a manner, can we also learn prayer? I find it interesting how they would bring John as an example to the Christ. (laughs) A bit of perspective. Why? Hmm. We are not certain, but the heart of man at times can be confused or in doubt or uh, in various ways. Perhaps at the moment that individual set forth by all the others to Christ was thinking, well, I remember how John taught us certain things. Maybe if Jesus teaches us this very manner of approach uh, with prayer, we, we can learn how it is constructed. Of course, Christ knows exactly how to pray to the Father. He is the Son. And so he says to them, and we must always honor the structure of the grammar. God chose to communicate with words. Words have grammar. And so we recognize its nearest antecedents and things of the kind so that we can honor the context and learn its practical application. Who was he speaking with? Well, he's speaking to them. Who are them? The disciples. What will we learn today, thousands of years further into this prayer that is of such importance that they need to be taught? And that's quite a revealing insight as well. Christianity is an educated people, and we are educated on how to pray. There is righteous guidance when a brother or sister approaches and says, in your prayer, I've learned. In our prayers, we've learned. And we hear each other and we learn, oh, yes, yes, okay, there is a structure. There is a a, a formula, if you will, into prayer and education. And so Jesus says to them, when you pray, say, and it is important that we understand he is teaching how to pray in the words he is uh, guiding them to speak. But we also have learned from the Gospel of Matthew that we must be careful not to fall prey to repetitive or vain prayer which at times can happen to the best of us. Thank you for the food. Well, we are thankful for the food. And though the prayer might just be, thank you, Lord, for the meal, 
it needs to be heartfelt. It needs to be dedicated and passionate. We are understanding the situation before our Father. When you pray, you say this, Father, and a great many of us, of course, were raised in certain various religious practices to recite this quite often. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. We take the time to understand what it is Jesus is teaching them. And it is categorized in six points, if you will. The first being the power we are speaking to. You know, as friends... Depending on our age, our greetings are common to one another. Hey, bro, what's, how, how's it going, man? Are you doing all right? Yeah, man. All right. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Hello, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, how's it going? We have this common dialect with each other, which is cultural and honorable. It should be. But it is common to one another because we understand that we are equal as human beings. And so we treat each other. We should treat each other equal as human beings. But when we approach God and we seek to speak to him, it's a bit different than, hey, how's it going, buddy? <laughs> how's it going, fam? Give me a pound. It, 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 we must come to him in an honorable way, a reverent, bowed position of mind, of course, in spirit and thought. Hallowed be your name. Unique is your authority called out separate than common man and common dialect you are of a power and authority we must honor and so when we begin to speak to you it is common for us as man to speak to him with the honor he deserves we understand that to a certain degree in regards to men and their kings and queens Yes, your honor, courts, judges. It's an honorable title that is given to the individual who may have had the education to be in a position of authority. Yes, officer. Yes, your honor. We read of faithful men in recorded accounts who would speak to their lords in such ways. Yes, lord. Now he's not speaking of the Lord, but he is giving the honor of the man who is the king or so on and so forth. So we understand the concept. So now within our thoughts in prayer to God, the power that has created all good things in motion, hallowed be your name. Unique is your authority. Your kingdom come immediately associated with the authority and power of the great I am, which permits us breath in our lungs is the kingdom. And that is fascinating and gives us insight into the priority of the Christ to his Father and the Father's thought for his people on this earth. Let us not be misguided or deceived by the persuasive teachings of those who would say, oh, you can have Jesus without his church. We spoke a bit about those things. You cannot separate both, for he shed his blood for the church for the greater good of his kingdom. Or we are told in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom. If it is the priority, the well-being of his church, his local assembly in which we submit to one another, to our elders, then it would make sense that through the uniqueness of his authority, immediately associated his kingdom is found. And it should be taught that way. And then as we move to point three, in verse three, give us each day our daily bread. God's authority has been recognized. His kingdom in association to be understood. Now that the priority of prayer is set forth, can we have food? Can we be provided for food, shelter, and clothing? Give us each day our daily bread. God knows it is a necessity of these physical vessels. And forgive us our sins. 
quite interesting, for nothing else truly matters if we do not have the forgiveness of our sins. You may walk this earth and become truly successful in a great many secular ways, great wealth and prestige, sociopolitical influence. You may find yourself in some of the most high-profiled positions, and if so, without Christ, his forgiveness of your sins, then truly a vain, vain existence. What is it all for? Nothing, if it's not for Christ. In other words, we here pray for everyone's success. We want us to be successful. We want us to cultivate wealth and have ourselves in positions of influence, but never without the Christ. It must be done for the Christ. And within the structure of prayer, we find the importance of it, forgiveness of sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone. And of course, Matthew, if you are rightly handling the two accounts, Matthew would indeed uh, uh, add uh, detail in the specific manner of our forgiveness. We can't be forgiven if we don't forgive others. Our brother comes to us and says, Brother, I've sinned against you and against God, and I am tremendously sorrowful for that. Is there any hope for me? And Well, there isn't. You, 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 you don't deserve to even... And then the, this, this malignant, arrogant... Well, I've just canceled my opportunity to forgiveness myself before God. Sadly, some brethren fall bitter to those ways because some brethren can hurt us pretty bad. But I assure you, as we've studied, if Judas would have repented, Jesus would have lovingly embraced him. So forgiveness is such an important part of our prayer that we forgive others. Christ forgives us. It is indeed a, a, a mutual agreement that must be seen. How could we receive forgiveness from Christ for the ways we have been and the, the sins we have done and turn around and neglect our brethren who seek forgiveness? Ah, you can't be forgiven. You've, you, you, you've hurt me too much. Oh, there may be some consequences. There may be some moments that we'll need to cultivate trust again and things like that. But forgiveness must be immediately given upon a sincere, humble request. It's important, so much so, it is part of our communication to God. And lead us not into temptation. Temptation is difficult. It is part of the Christian life. Some of us, perhaps, more so in measurement, uh, 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 tempted harsh. Well, for instance, let me put it this way. When you come up out of that water, born again, saved by the grace of Christ, washed of sins, and, and, and you've been added a, a, as a legal citizen to the kingdom, you are new. In Christ, a new creature in Christ, a newness of life. But you've just left the world. So there are many things that has scarred your thoughts and your flesh. And so you still struggle with perhaps deep temptations from your life prior to your new birth. Some of us perhaps have been able to control that after 10, 20, 30 years in the church. We are still tempted by many things, but we've had more of the temperament to control the temptation either or the point is we should ask god not to lead us into temptation god of course would not purposely lead us into sin he does not do that it's not his nature but this fallen world certainly does in our own flesh we'll call we'll will we'll, we'll spring forth a thought of sin oh i know i shouldn't be doing that or saying this but the point, of course, in its most important priority in the structure of the prayer. We beg God, please to keep me away from temptations that are going to lead me into a sinful location. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to sin against you, Father. I don't want to sin against my brethren. I want to learn how to be productive in your kingdom. And so given here in these verses from verse 2, 3, and 4, is a model of prayer we should all remember. If we find ourselves uncertain of the words to speak, if you will, or perhaps caught in, 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 in either great joy or great sorrow, 
We remember the structure. It has kept me focused when I pray and it has helped me greatly and I know it helps you as well. Number one, God is power. He is unique. Let us honor him in speech that way. Let us understand the importance of his kingdom and the well-being of his kingdom. We always pray for more growth. Why? Because it means more souls can go to heaven. And we understand that we need food, shelter, and clothing. We need forgiveness of sins and we should forgive others. And to remain within the forgiveness of sins, we do not want to be led astray by our own temptations or the temptations of this world and then fall into an habitual sinful practice that would withdraw us from his grace. And then he said to them, now in the importance of prayer, so the the uh, account in which he is going to speak is quite fascinating. May we all pay attention. This would help us greatly. Then he says to them, his disciples, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For I have a friend of mine, he's come to me on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. It is customary in hospitality, of course, that I should be giving him something. It's, it's, a, it's something that we should do, absolutely. But he's speaking, which is interesting, Christ is speaking it through the lens of a uh, godless world. So he's saying in the godless world, here's what can happen. Here's an illustration from the godless world, if you will. A friend comes to another friend's door, give me food because I have another friend come over from a long journey and he's hungry and I want to give him something to eat and I have nothing, so help me out. And of course, within the age of that era, that was a, co a common custom. I remember growing up uh, in Parker Road, an industrial road, and uh, uh, we would have individuals who would come to the door. I still remember them today. Could I have butter? Could I have sugar? Could I have some milk? Could I have something, you know? Uh, and uh, of course, mom and dad were always gracious uh, to help out when they could and uh, sometimes give uh, a bit of an instruction uh, to help uh, the individual out and things like that. Neighborly, right? Neighborly. So the world understands this concept and Christ is bringing it forth to his disciples and saying, uh, revealing this account. So it continues. This individual needs food from his friend to help his other friend. And I tell you, verse 8, uh, sorry, verse, uh, let me see here, verse 7. And from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. <laughs> I cannot, maybe I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm comfortable. I'm at, uh, why, oh, why is this happening to me, right? Ding dong at 3 a.m. What on earth does he want from me? <laughs> I tell you, even though he will not get up in verse 8 and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So out there in the unbelieving world, you see these things take place. Come on, man. Get, help me out. Help me out. What? I'm not going to stop knocking on your door. I need some food to help my... Uh. Persistence. I have nothing. Lend me. I have nothing. Friend says, I cannot. What persistence? He continues. So I say to you in verse 9, ask... And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Ask, seek, knock, given, find, opened. If the world itself understands the concept and practice it towards itself out there in the world, well, how much more will our Father through the Son give to us? For everyone, he says in verse 10, who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. It's not maybe. It will happen. You made it here for a reason. Something happened providentially. Now, suppose one of your fathers, in verse 11, is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Well, I hope not. Maybe a prank of sorts, right? 
or he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? From nourishment to something that might harm him. Never mind just saying he wants an egg and I gave him uh, a waffle. He goes from an egg to a scorpion. He goes from a fish to a snake. Wow. That's a, there's a big gap between the two. One nourishes your body, it sustains you for something, and the other one might harm you and take your life. Interesting indeed. If you then, in verse 13, being evil, oh wow, evil? How? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, as an unbeliever, as an evildoer, you, you, you know how to give what is asked of you from your friend, from your children. And we see that. Matter of fact, a, an awakening moment in my faith through, through our journey was when I recognized that some Christians have a lesser integrity and quality towards each other and their children than some of the heathen out there do. I was like, that can't be, but it is. It shouldn't be, but it is. And so Jesus says, if you can even recognize that out there, this evil world, this godless mind is capable of producing such mercy, producing an exchange that will not harm, but benefit and, and nourish. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, may we not take that verse out of its context and context and make it some kind of a sensational myth. It's quite practical. The penmanship of the Holy Spirit wrote this book. In the first age, the first era of uh, the, the century at hand, there was indeed a miraculous power, an agency that was permitted. There are many facets to the verse in connection to the context. In simplicity, from what I've been able to understand within the confines of its context and respecting and honoring all other verses to it, the agency to the Father is the Son. And the Scriptures would also say the Spirit. So through this agency, the Father hears and the Father gives. If you then, being evil, and he is, of course, addressing the disciples, with the illustration of this fallen world, how, uh, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If we are praying in accordance to his will, through the Spirit, to the Father, through the Son, to the Father, God, he will indeed deliver the prayer for it is according to his will. Now there are things that are left to his design in which we must oblige to his answer. We may pray for, um, I don't know, maybe we pray for a house. Uh, we want a house. We pray for a house. We used to pray for a house. We wanted to come to God first to know if it was okay to have a house. Well, it took a while before we were permitted to have a house. That's on his accord, his will, his providence. It's uncertain. Will he permit us to have a house? Will he permit me to have this employment? Will he permit me to purchase this vehicle? Will he permit me to, to go here, to go there? Those things at times are uncertain to our mind, so we wait his answer. And his answer may take 10 years, may take 10 months, may take 10 hours. There are other certainties. There are other prayers that are in certainty. Lord... Can you grow your church? Well, we know the answer to that one. He wants to grow his church. We pray for individuals who are lost that they may become saved. God wants that. So there are prayers that, according to his will that are certain and we know he will fulfill because it is according to his will. Others, it is perhaps a design of our uh, thoughts that we seek this comfort or we seek this uh, employment or, or whatnot. And if it is in the utility of, the, of his kingdom, he may permit it. And we pray in such ways. 
Now that is to that category of the prayer. But of course, in the spiritual sense, in priority, when we seek Christ, when the unbeliever is pierced and seeks Christ, he will ask questions to that end. Not only will he ask questions to that end, he will seek it in desperation. And he will, out of what is inwardly growing in his questions and search, he will knock. He will act upon this desire. When we came to Christ, there was nothing to be set in our way. And the devil certainly tried to stop us. But nothing was going to get in our way. We must know the purpose of life. We must know the story of this man named Jesus. Is it true? Is it a lie? Is there a heaven or a hell? Is there a God? Is it all fables we've been given by our parents and their parents and their parents? Is it a vain tradition? Because, you know, science would tell us there is no God. The experts would tell us. And they're experts. How are we? To, we should never question the experts. <laughs> Be careful with the experts. They'll have you drinking poison quite quickly. <laughs> so here is in its wonderful uh, uh, portion of Scripture delivering the uh, uh, session of prayer we should have. And not only the session of prayer in its, in its uh, 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 delivery, but also the method of the heart with it which I find quite interesting. If the world is capable of taking care of its own, why are you worried about the Father taking care of His own? Have the heart of faith. Know that when you ask Him, when you are seeking and you are knocking, it will be given. We know the boundaries to that, obviously. We have free will. So if we pray that a certain loved one obeys the gospel, that certain loved one must activate in his heart this search. But our prayer certainly activates the providential path to challenge that loved one whom we want to obey the gospel. It's a beautiful thing. And so much more could be said. And I, at times, most certainly found, find myself uh, uh, lacking in, 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 in proclaiming it with the depth it deserves but nonetheless you and i together we can read and we can understand what we read and we have ourselves a, a system of intelligence from this inspired text that allows us to see it allows us to see the, per, the the necessity of our persistence of our asking and seeking and knocking the order in which we pray to god and give him honor and the open door which is available of course, the forgiveness of sins. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You want to know the information of this book. You read the information of this book. It generates a faith within your heart and you outwardly practice such faith. If you have such faith in Christ to be born again, you qualify as a repentant believer. And therein, in our conclusion... Anyone who lives on this earth and has access to the faculties of his thought, who has breath in his lungs or her lungs, can choose to follow the Christ and be saved by his mercy. We cannot meritoriously earn our salvation. We must trust in the lawmaker, not only in the law. And if we are to submit to his will and make the lifelong commitment to love him as best as we can, then we qualify to call on his name and be buried, to be buried with him, baptized, out of the water, born again to newness of life, all through the work of God, all through the work of God, nothing we can boast of. We simply submit to his will and love, but that is a lifelong commitment that one must count the cost before participating in. And this here structure of Scripture certainly gives us the bridge forward in asking, seeking, and knocking, and the power therein. If there is anyone here, of course, who wants to study this matter further afterwards, please approach one of us. If any of us here seeks to obey the gospel, it's available to you, no doubt. Thank you for your time. Lord willing, next week we will follow through with the rest of the chapter.
And now we go to a song. Father, we are... 